Humpty Dumpty Dirty Dublin, doubling Dublin, dissembler, betrayer. Lucia does not belong here, with all the short squat people and their concrete faces, the short squat buildings and the ghoul grey skies. There is no beauty in this city, made grimmer by chimney and gathering cumulus. There is none of the gilded glamour of Paris, or the grandeur of Zurich, or the verdure of Trieste, with its green gold ring of pine thick hills. This is Babo's city, not hers. Never was, never will be. No wonder he went wandering. But she is here to bring his spirit home to the city that dares not speak his name except to curse his infamy. After all he has done for the country that spat him out, it is time that it knelt to him and paid obeisance. She will make this city sing his name. My name is Sarah Keating and I'm DLR Writer in Residence 2020 to 2021. I've spent the last year finishing my first book, Fall and Recover, about dancer Lucia Joyce, whose father was the famous writer, James. Although the family lived in Europe for most of their lives, Lucia spent a significant few months in Dublin in 1935. In my story, Bloomsday 1935, which is excerpted from the longer work, I imagine a single day during her stay in Dublin, condensing the drama of those months into a single 24-hour period, when Lucia, like Leopold Bloom, her father's greatest creation, makes an odyssey through the streets of Dublin. In Ulysses, Bloom sets about the course of an ordinary day in his pedestrian life. In Bloom's Day 1935, Lucia sets about seeking the ghost of her father's past selves. Lucia choo-choos in from her seaside hideaway in Bray, where Bobbo was but a boy when his house almost fell into the sea. She knocked the door just this morning, eager to see the bedroom where he looked across the strand to the mountain grinning a giant reflection of his face. Bray head is carved from the skull and bones of him. It bears well the depth of his short, narrow brow, the overhang of his two small eyes, the tense thrust of his determined chin. But the maid shut the door fast upon her, catching her toe. Now she is clattering along the salt throbbing coast, one and two and one and two mocks the slow, quaint waltz of the steamer. Past Sandy Cove it shunters, the Martello where Bobbo bumped down with Buck Mulligan. An absurd place to live, an absurd place to nearly die. Still, a good story, and Bobbo revels in the telling when in reminiscing mood, pulling her onto his lap, shoulder to shoulder, hands upon hands. In 1935, Lucia Joyce had given up dancing. She had spent the 1920s training in Paris and performing with some of modern dance's greatest masters. She worked with the choreographer Raymond Duncan, brother of the famous ballerina Isadora Duncan. She joined a troupe of young women experimenting with form. They call themselves Les Rhythmes et Couleurs, and they toured Europe to great acclaim. She made a short film with Jean Renoir, and she was well known within the emerging modern dance movement and hailed for her talent. One critic commented after her performance in a competition, one day James Joyce will be known as father of his daughter Lucia. But by the mid 1930s, Lucia's career had fizzled out. With the encouragement of her family, she stopped dancing and she started teaching, but she had a series of personal crises and spent the early part of the 1930s in and out of sanatoriums, being treated for a variety of nervous disorders. Out of the slim fjord of Irish town, Lucia stalks the low shrubs, an animal searching for its den. She stops and sniffs the sea scent, salt, seaweed, sewage. Deep into her lungs, rich and round her body it flows. At Sandy Mount Strand, the tide is drawn back as far as she can see. Above, a lunar miracle hangs, a big shiny coin where before there was only blackness. In the moon candescence, the sand is flat, marble and deceptive, warm and gluey underfoot. Underfoot? She has lost her shoes. The sand slippers and soothes, soft touch for the hard calluses. Of a sudden, she is weary, will-worn, well-worn out. 
The first lick of the water's freezing curl on her toes is the gasp of a baby born, the shock of air on its new life lungs. With a quick come surge of the sea, she is under. She grabs breath and swallows water, mouth and lungs full of hard salt crystals. Dr. Veen hovers above, strong hands on shoulders, holding her down in the icy bath in Kusnacht. Oh, she knows how to resist. She will fight and fight this. She knows all the tricks. In 1934, Lucia was sent to London to live with her father's patron, Harriet Shaw Weaver. Joyce was near completing Finnegan's Wake, which she'd been working on for more than a decade. Lucia and her father had a really intense relationship, and both her dancing and her emotional instability were thought to have been the primary influences on the book. At this stage of its development, it was decided that Lucia's illness was too distracting for him. London was a disaster, so Lucia was sent on to Dublin, where Joyce's sister Eileen lived. She was set up in a cottage at the back of Bray Head, close to where Joyce had spent his early childhood. In my story, this parallel becomes an important part of Lucia's experience of the city, as she traces her father's life, trying to reclaim a part of him for herself through their forced separation. Just as her father had spent his childhood moving from house to house in Dublin, so Lucia's life was shaped by her family's restless pursuit of home. The climax comes when she meets his ghost at Blackrock Park and they come together to dance. Blackrock Park lies ahead of her, gates with a loose chain across them in polite request. The low wall bears easy breaching. Inside, steep slopes scalped like a soldier lead down again to the sea. In the beds, buds are shaking off blankets of earth, bluebells and daffodils. The grand bandstand salutes her with a trumpet solo as she passes. Oh, but of course, she will dance. The trees shake their empty branches at her in encouragement. Up the steps, and she bows to the low stage, feels how its brick floor warms to her bare feet. Music? Yes. She summons the conductor with the wide embrace of her arms. Then the violins, the woodwind, the timpani, the triangle chime together, playing the devil's chord, the tight, pulled back string of anticipation. Zig, zig. See, the harp plucks the twelve midnight bells of the dance macabre, calling the dead to dance. This night, Lucia is one of the summoned, called from the grave to give life to death's dark mood and passion. And here's her partner, crawling out of the once upon to hold her hand, black suit and skinny spider legs flung one, two, one, two. It is Bobbo. He has come, bleached orbs big as headlamps behind his glasses. With his milky gaze, he sees right through her to the charred edges of her black heart, the ashy cinders of her soul. Whispery comforts suffuse the sin dark. Lucia, Lucia. His raspy Dublinese, bright and persuasive as morning dew, clear as glass, it cuts her heart in two. Oh, how she has missed him. She feels his acid breath upon her upturned face, his clammy hand cupping hers, fingers knotted and knitting, a pulled, insistent prayer. Come with me. Ah, yes, he will lead and she will follow. It was her mistake to think it ever would be different. She extends her foot gingerly, toes flexed in high arch and the symphony begins to swell inside her. She leaps, hey ho. The sky pitch and air turn, she is falling, falling. Brise, ballon, she falls and falls, his arms outstretched to catch her. Hands on her waist again, face to her face again. Yes, I will, Babo, yes, I will, yes. She holds the pleasure as long as the lute allows. She knows the change is coming, and it does. The piano forte descends chords through the keys, low notes that reverberate deep in her belly, notes of disquiet that crash in her bowels. Bewitched, Lucia's body obeys its commands and fouettes away from her partner. 
Her bare feet buckle. She spins and stops and spins and stops on the worn knuckle of her toes. She is in time, then out of time. Her body ignoring the music as each tourant is transformed into torture. The xylophone's bone crack rattles are her own. The music ends abruptly. There is no fade out, no pianissimo, no thunderous ovation. She collapses, a heap upon the floor. She reaches out for Babo's hand to help her up, but he is not beside her. There is nothing more undignified than a woman dancing without a partner. Whispery hiss of his disapproval. That familiar sting. Lucia's stay in Dublin was punctuated by its own dramas. She disappeared in the Dublin mountains. She painted the interior of her Bray cottage black, set a fire in the centre of the living room. But it's the image of a young, vulnerable woman walking the same streets once owned by her father, by her father's most famous creation, that really resonate for me. How this young woman who lived through her body is exposed so dangerously by her failing mind. And so she walks and walks, every stride a reminder of her frailty, as she is not as resilient as the paving stone. With every step, she feels the weakness of her anatomy, her mortality. With every step, she is exposed as mere tissue and bone, her mind as dull as knife on stone. <laughs>